I always said there's three things that I always wanted to do with a winery. Make really good wine, have great customer service, and a really cool place to hang out. I didn't want to come out with an upscale wine. Fruit wines are not an upscale wine. I know that I'm not going to be compared to French wineries or Napa Valley wineries. So I wanted to make sure that the wines that I have kind of speak to what they are. Country, southern, simple. I wanted them to be blueberry. I wanted it to be strawberry. I wanted it to be very easy for someone to see the bottle and know what's inside of it. And then once they open it, have an idea of what it's going to taste like. And then be surprised by how high of a quality of wine that what you wouldn't consider would make a good wine, it actually does. So your first one is the dry blueberry. This is 100% blueberry, nothing in it but blueberries. No water, no concentrates, no artificial flavors, and all the blueberries that went into that wine came from the state of Georgia. And some of the blueberries that are in this wine came from my farm, uh, but not all. Yep. Blackberries and blueberries. You know, a lot of people ask me um, what my favorite is, and I tell them I don't really have one. And they'd be like asking me which my favorite child is, which right now is my daughter because my, yeah. yeah, my son's not here. You know which one yeah. it is. Um, <laughs> But uh, I tell you, which one I would be in the mood for right now? Like if I was just pop up in a bottle, which one I would drink right now? Um, probably this Bramble and Sam here. The first batch of wine that I made was a blackberry apple wine. Um, it's it's the Bramble and Sam. It's the one with my dog on it. It's 80% blackberry, 20% apple. Apples take on the flavor of whatever it's being added to. I like the nectarine a lot. Though. Do you? The nectarine is very it's, good. it's got a lot of really cool flavors in it, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When it's I, strong. I like it. Very strong flavor. When I was fermenting it, I thought during the fermentation process, it might take away and be more of a peachy flavor mm -hmm. and lose its nectarine quality. Yeah. And instead, the fermentation process highlighted yeah, the nectarine. Yeah, yeah. If anything, if it was going to taste like yeah. a peach, the fermentation process took that away. Over the last five years, um, we've seen a tremendous growth, really the last 15 years, a tremendous growth in the wine industry. Kind of hit a little plateau with the economic recession, but now we're back and it just continues to grow. Every year we see new wineries, vineyards opening, and right now we're at a 57 wineries in the state. Traditionally, the grapes that were successful in Georgia grew in the South, and they were Muscadine. And today we grow 24 different kinds of Muscadine. In the North, uh, particularly from Atlanta north and up into the Blue Ridge, you're going to see more Vina Vinifera and some American and French hybrids. The wineries in the state are characterized by extreme diversity. Some are trying to compete with world-class wines by growing traditional wine varietals like Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay, and other wineries have embraced the Muscadine as a native grape that could brand Georgia as a unique wine region. While these two approaches are vastly different, all wineries support local economic development through tourism and festivals. Wine America did a study last year that the overall impact is about $4 billion in the state of Georgia for wine. Now that's all wines. That's wines produced in the state, out of the state. That's just wine sold in the state and the offshoot economic impact of that could be tourism, taxes, all of those things, jobs. But within the state right now, wines that are produced in the state of Georgia are having retail sales of about $25 million, and that's just produced in the state by farm wineries in Georgia right now. Well, we're from Atlanta. From Lawrenceville, Georgia. From Tifton, Georgia. I'm from Lula. I'm from Lula. I am here on a bachelorette weekend, and I live in New York. I've never been to a wine tasting before, so it's a first for me. And it's my birthday. I came here last year for the first time because I just, I don't know, I just like trying wine and trying new things, and this was gonna be a new experience for me. We came because it's great day outside and we want to sample some wine. And our husbands would not want to go to this. Absolutely not. They want to fish. Yeah. So we came here instead. Yeah. They don't like wine. They prefer Bud Light. Bud Light only. No craft beer, no wine, no anything else. Bud Light. I'm all about dry. I love my dry wines. Maybe a full body, red, uh, dry wine. I really prefer the sweet things. I have a serious okay. sweet tooth. We're both more white drinkers and rosé drinkers just because we're not great with the tannins. When I think of Georgia wine, it's strong. <laughs> it's tough, stout, but it's good. It doesn't taste like gasoline. It's all natural. It's not like store-bought, really. I feel like I'm yeah, organic. Yeah, strong, half dragon's <laughs> breath or nothing like that. Yeah. It's really smooth. I can honestly say I knew nothing of North Georgia wine. 
I knew of wine from Cali, from France, and things, Italy, things like that, but I did not know Georgia had its own wineries or vineyards and things like that. When I go to the local grocery store and I buy wine, I think about my favorite flavors and the alcohol content yeah. and what kind alcohol of day I've content. had. Yes. Yeah. That, if it's a bad that day, matters. then I'm going up. That matters. Yeah. The worse the day, the higher the alcohol content. When you go to stores, I, maybe because they're small and not as large as other companies you, they don't really market out in stores because a lot of these places don't ship or anything so you actually have to go to their vineyards and i'm sure like a lot of mom and pop vineyards are like that too so i i just think the marketing isn't there for them or they don't have the funds to market as much as those name brands we get wines from maybe 15 to 20 different wineries i mean most people's problems here are simply growing enough fruit a lot of wineries have to have a lot for weddings and such, so they keep a lot at their property and we don't get, we're not able to source and not able to sell a lot of the wineries that we'd like to represent. Because we have a lot of small vineyards, and we have wineries that are 27 or so that have less than six acres, and they may only be producing enough wines to provide their tasting rooms. Most of them do not have distributors and therefore are not producing uh, enough volume wine that they can consistently provide wine to a restaurant. Surprisingly, Georgia has a wine history that dates back to the colonial era. I started getting really interested if Georgia had a wine history when I first got interested in the, in the business and found out a tremendous wine history. Liter actually, Georgia, you could, you could legitimately say that they were formed as a vineyard colony because they had to find right off the bat after 1733 when they were established, they had to find something to export to be uh, sustainable. So the, the two main things they were supposed to do was produce silk and wine, the luxury items for England. And so they got most of their money from Parliament promising for the first eight years, promising to get the wine industry going because they never did get ready to get going. But it took off after that by the early 1820s, uh, the best winemaker in America lived in South Georgia, according to all the people around the nation. He was, he was sending Georgia wine up to John Quincy Adams as early as 1824. So it's, uh, we've got a long history. By the Civil War, they were one of the bigger, great wine producers and kind of died out during the war. But after that, they got built back up again. By the 1880s and 1890s, the industry had really got thriving again. By, by, by the time of Prohibition, Georgia is one of the top four wine producers in the entire nation. We were shipping train loads of grapes and wine to all the big northern cities. And so it was really going good. And in, in Georgia, in their lack of wisdom, I would say, had prohibition 13 years before national. And so all these immigrants from here and all this business, they had their own glass factories around making bottles. It was huge. And they shut it down and pulled up the grape vines and planted cotton, and most of the immigrants uh, went, went back north. So it was a, it was a thrive. It was one of the Georgia's main industries before Prohibition. Everybody said, oh, I'd like to see Georgia getting in the wine business. We're, we're not starting the wine industry, we're restarting it because we had a deep, long history. Oh, we have be, a seat. Okay. So we're excited about teaming up with them to, uh, to help publicize our winners from our wine competition. Well, that's great. The thriving wine industry Georgia had before, before Prohibition was due to a lot of people they brought in that had expertise. Uh, particularly West Georgia, they brought in hundreds and hundreds of Hungarian immigrants that had that come into Pennsylvania. And they also had a lot of Germans and Swiss. They brought in French winemakers. So, I mean, at one time they had to bring in interpreters from Ellis Island uh, over there just to communicate with everybody. In like the uh, thousand acres or so they, of grapes they had in Habersham County, primarily Swiss families settled it. There were big vineyards in South Georgia, like, like the Tiff Brothers in Tifton. Uh, they had a, they had a, Italian winemakers and had Frenchmen coming in, and a lot of little town, little towns in South Georgia had as many as three wineries. So they all brought in expertise at planting, trellising, and making wine, which nobody here had. So they basically made the industry go. We still have to rely on a lot of immigrant help. There's several of the bigger wineries have brought in European winemakers. I'm originally from uh, uh, Italy. Piedmont is my area. So I have a degree in enology and viticulture from the University of North Melbourne in Australia. A lot of people have to get the immigrant help to help with the harvest or they wouldn't be able to do it because they really can't get locals to do it. Immigrants that are working with us are very vital, especially at harvest time. When it's time to bring the grapes in, you need to have a lot of people as quickly as possible. The immigrants that have come from Mexico and Guatemala 
work very hard, actually outperform some of our Americans that we wish would work harder. Maybe they have a different appreciation. It's kind of odd in a way that it depended on the immigrants to start with, and it's somewhat depended on today to get get the help and expertise we need. I was wondering, since you specialize in uh, fruit wines, um, is there some snobbery kind of in the wine community about <laughs> doing fruit wines instead? Yeah, really? yeah, there are some wineries that, that um, they don't think what I do is, is, is actually making wine, it's making fruit juice with alcohol. <laughs> There's a certain prestige in wine, in the wine culture. Um, wine has been around for a very, very long time, and the staple and the expectation for wine is it's grape. You know, Merlots and Chardonnays and Shiraz and stuff like that. So when you come up with a more simpler wine or something that's not made from a grape, it isn't always looked up upon, it's most, mostly looked down upon. It's a lower quality wine. And there are certain people who have set certain parameters for what a wine actually is, and fruit wines don't meet those parameters. So it has been difficult to fit into the wine community. When you're young and you're, you're an entrepreneur, you just want to go do it and you think the world is you know, it's just easy and you can just jump at it and get things going. And it's not that way. The hurdles have been not only endless, but there's been a lot of them. The biggest hurdle that comes to mind is trying to get the local county on board. I didn't know how much impact or I guess you could say even permission that I would have to have in order to get the winery started. You got to see if your county allows it first, then you have the state license, then you have the federal license, and then you got to keep really close, close taps on every ounce of alcohol you sell and pay and pay excise tax. So it's, it's a lot of hoops to jump through. Everyone right now is producing under what is called a farm winery license. We don't have any commercial wineries in Georgia. And what that is is a special license for wineries who are growing um, and buying the majority of their product from within the state to produce their wines. Now, the way this law is, is written at the time is that at least 40% of the fruit utilized to produce your wine must be from within the state of Georgia. Prohibition laws, the biggest thing held over from that, and I think there's only five states left that have this, they set up a, uh, for any alcohol, set up a three-tier system. You know, you couldn't be a producer, distributor, or a retailer, y'all had to be separate. So all the wines have to go through a distributor. And so, it, you know, it just didn't make sense to you know, for, for economic development to add a middleman. I fortunately uh, beat the system. I became my own distributor early on. So I can go straight to restaurants and straight to wine shops. Most wineries can't do that and have to pay that extra distributor to make that happen. So when we started this project, I did not want any outside investors. We did it as a family. My wife and I are very involved. We do the tours. We're involved with all the projects. And then our son, Eric, has come on board to be our general manager, so it is now generational. It makes a lot of fun. We have six grandchildren. We named the vineyards after our granddaughters. We're expecting our grandsons to be working in the summer. So it is a family project that we can all have fun and enjoy. What's unique about Georgia is the latitude and longitude in which it's positioned. It's divided into five physiographic regions. About 930 acres are produced. Out of those 930 acres, about 60% is muscadine. We are the largest muscadine producers in the United States. One of the largest producers of muscadines in the state is Still Pond Vineyard in South Georgia. We have 180 acres of vines. Uh, typically, we'll see around, we'll harvest uh, in the neighborhood of 1,000 tons of muscadine grape. There's a tremendous amount of value found in the muscadine grapes. The only grape that, that will grow prolifically here in the, in the South is definitely a Southern thing. It's been a, uh, a, a secret of the South for many years. Good morning, buddy. Hey, Bob. We're getting it out more and more, more and more people are, are beginning to enjoy that sweet, musky taste of the grape that uh, has gained it so much popularity here in the last few years. We're very proud of the fact that every one of our wines are single estate. Uh, everything in that bottle, in exception to the flavor infused uh, wines, uh, the base wine was all made right here on the farm where the fruit was grown. So that's something that we pride ourselves as being that, as being a third generation family business is being one of the premier wineries of South Georgia uh, to open and the only winery and distillery uh, here in the state. You want to go take a look at those vines? Yeah, let's go. 
The our goal here at Steel Pond is to provide and take care of our family and friends through this facility here. Uh, generation number four is uh, 10 years old here on the farm now, and hopefully he can continue on with that should he so desire. But uh, we're not here to become millionaires. We know that's long since gone past. We like to eat, we like a good roof over our head, and we'd like to maintain and provide a good life for everyone here associated with us. The mustard dime is sort of like the catfish in the South. At one time, the catfish wasn't high on the list for seafood. Once you take them out of the environment, do something different, they the greatest seafood. So also with the mustard dime, when people get a quiet taste for that particular mustard dime, or whatever the case might be, that's, you can't find that taste nowhere in the world. You can only get it out of the southeast part of the United States. When you think about the South, then you find the muscadine as the symbol of the enology and the viticulture in the South. It's a link unique in the world where a variety is actually native from the place, didn't move anywhere else, but is cultivated there, made into wine and consumed as a wine and as a grape. So when you taste muscadine wine, I would say when you smell muscadine wine, you smell the fresh grapes varietal notes that are in the grapes that never change and become exactly the same, rest the same into the wine. Most of these notes are grassy notes, pineapple notes, mango notes, passion fruit, exotic together with something herbaceous like the grass. When I came to Georgia, everybody thought the muscadine uh, is, is a bad wine is, uh, because it's cheap to, uh, to grow and, uh, and therefore the winemaking technique that was applied because it was cheap to grow was also cheap winemaking technique. Well, if you apply a cheap winemaking technique to a Chardonnay, you will have a bad Chardonnay. If you apply a premium winemaking technique to muscadine, you will have a great muscadine wine. When I started to point in my all energy into making high quality muscadine wine, I experimented in different sugar level of the Finnish wine. Well, those wine were sent to the major wine competition in the country, where panel of judges are just blindly judging wine, okay, in each category. And this wine from muscadine out of Chicago, San Francisco, uh, San Diego, etc., etc., they were coming back with gold medal, with best of class, with double gold. The assumption of uh, you know, muscadine being for not real wine drinker or not real wine connoisseur is just because even the real wine connoisseur, they don't know muscadine. Or they are too close into what a wine should be that they don't actually judge it for what it is. Because if they do, they'll find a lot of uh, good, good benefit and feature in that. One of the first comments is when they taste our muscadine wine is that, oh, it reminds me of uh, my grandma. And then, uh, and then they start thinking and they go back, oh, actually, yes, in the backyard we were picking the grapes and the grapes just tasted like this wine and is actually the same sweet level, the same flavor. That's exactly what muscadine is for the South, is a feeling, is a relation, is a, is a, is a memory. The reason I don't like muscadine is because it's... To me, it smells like feet. <laughs> I'm from Michigan, I like cherries. I don't like muscadine. It just smells weird and it, it affects the flavor to me, the smell. I love yeah. muscadine. I grew up here eating it on the weekends, picking it off the vine, you know. That's I did something, not. Something we did as a child, so <laughs> I think it's a great flavor. Some vineyards emphasize muscadine because they are native to the state and are adapted to grow here. Others attempt to grow the classic vinifera grapes that can only grow up in the mountains. When people think of Georgian wine, they think of you know, muscadine wine. They don't think of Cabernet Sauvignon. So um, you know, for us, it's been a challenge reaching the wine consumer and basically saying there's more to Georgia than just muscadine. There's nothing wrong with muscadine wines, and you know, people love muscadine wines, and that's great. But you know, for us, we're going after more of the fine wine uh, consumer and folks that are, are into French wines and wines from California and showing that we can grow those same grapes here in Georgia and we can do it just as good as they can. We're just now starting to kind of turn the corner and turn some more heads and, and get more folks up to see what we're doing and more folks are getting really excited about, uh, about what they're tasting. Georgia has a stigma about it. No one expects the wine to be good. 
So when people come on up, taste our wine and actually walk through the vineyard and experience it, they're, they're pleasantly surprised at, oh, wow. And we can tell a big difference in quality in the Georgia wines, especially in the last six or eight years. We can produce some excellent wines and do that in a blind tasting you would be hard to compare. This year we sent our wines to the San Francisco Chronicle Wine Contest, which is the Super Bowl of all wine contests, and we got back four wines that got gold medals. We were excited. We entered a lot of competitions each year, San Francisco Chronicle, San Francisco International, uh, Los Angeles International. Those are probably three of the most uh, prestigious in the United States, and we always send our state wines uh, that we've received over 200 medals. I'm the only winemaker uh, east of California that has taken uh, double gold, best of category uh, for white wine, red wine, and sparkling wines. Several wine shops told me that Georgia wines aren't their best sellers when compared to national or international wines. However, customers seem to really enjoy the experience of visiting a winery and enjoying the scenic beauty. Some of these are as beautiful as you would experience if you're going out to Napa Valley, and we've been out there probably a dozen times or more. When a customer drinks a bottle of wine and they look at the label and it says Georgia on it, then you can be guaranteed that has at least 75% of Georgia produced fruit in it. That's a federal law. Obviously the focus here is on our estate grown wines, but there is a need for out-of-state fruit, um, acts of mother nature, you know, things that happen on at least four or five different occasions. We've pretty much lost all of our fruit at freezes or frosts. We have a frost protection system here. We have to be, you know, looking at it overnight. Sometimes we may have to come in at 2 a.m., 4 a.m. So some of the weather challenges we face as grape growers in Georgia is the threat of spring frost, which can reduce a crop. And uh, in addition to the high humidity and the hot temperature, uh, fungal diseases are, are very prevalent and pervasive. And that, that fungal, that uh, hot, humid weather exacerbates um, the fungal diseases we see on our grapes. So we have, you know, supplemented with some out-of-state growers. Uh, those wines stay completely separate from our, uh, our, our estate portfolio. And we actually have different labels for each of those bottles of wine, you know, to kind of uh, keep them separate uh, so the consumer can easily know which wines are, are from the estate and which wines may have a, a blend of some fruit from out of state. Yeah, definitely poor fruit set due to the weather this year. Yeah, it's, it rained too. A few of our blocks. So I've seen that in, in a pretty good bit of our blocks. Poor fruit set? Yeah. Well, it, it rained for two yeah, weeks around exactly. bloom. Like, we can increase crop in some, some cultivars, like Petit Man saying that's already a low yielder. Mm -hmm. We increase yield over at Carl's place, over at uh, Stonewall, by 40%. While many producers are forced to purchase fruit from other growers in and outside the state, some vineyards emphasize estate wines, which are made entirely from grapes grown on their property. These wines have the potential to be more distinctive than store-bought wines. I think what's amazing about what we're able to achieve here is the fact that we're sending these wines off to California to some of the most prestigious competitions in the world, and we're able to take uh, these double gold medals and best of categories with fruit that's grown in Georgia. It's one thing if you, if you were to bring the grapes from California, make the wine here and send it back, to me there's really no point in doing that. So we only send our 100% estate-grown wines from Georgia off to these California competitions. With my work at Yona Mountain Vineyards in Cleveland, we have developed a really good killer Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, and a Meritage, all from our estate. And everything is being very well received. And the benefit and the romance of having an estate wine is you taste the year, the ground, everything that sense of place is within a glass. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll check the card for what kind of insects we've got going on in the vineyard right now. And then we'll do a very simple. Great, it looks like we have some. We're looking pretty clear. Still a little bit of green on the flavor. Seeds are starting to, to brown up nicely, pull away from the pulp. And we're getting some coloring as well, which is, is nice. So based on what I'm seeing and what I'm tasting right now, I'm gonna say that we're probably three, maybe four weeks out from harvest. Where Sugar's getting up there, the, the phenolics are starting to taste where they need to be. There's no rot, which is fantastic. What I want to do is I want to ensure that we, we have these hang for as long as possible to ensure the, the phenolic ripeness. So the, the flavor compounds end up becoming no green, no grassiness. Yeah. I just, just want to ensure that we have as much fruit flavors, the black fruits, the, the red fruits that we can possibly get out of this block. Oh, it is looking good. Nicely exposed. Okay, we've got enough. Let's go do some testing. What do you think we're at right now? 
I think we're going to be around 20 bricks. I think the, uh, the pH is going to be a little higher than what we're actually anticipating or needing. I'm guessing 19, 20 in the bricks and the sugar, 18.3. So we're not too far off. And then we'll check our pH levels. And I want to say we're probably going to be 3738, 3.69. I'll take it. So 3.69 and 18.3. That's not bad. So yeah, we're definitely three, three to four weeks away as long as it doesn't rain. She's alive. Every year is different. This year we had heavy rain during flowering, uh, which impacts the fruit set and therefore we're, we're down roughly around about 75-80% on our fruit this year. So uh, that's given us, you know, last year on one block we had had eight tonnes, this year we're down to around about two tonne. So that really impacts our financial base. 2018 proved to be a difficult year for many wine growers in Georgia, especially those growing the vinifera grapes in the north. The heavy rains in April determine the fate of the harvest in fall, which produced low yields for many growers. Despite the difficult weather conditions and the cumbersome Georgia laws, what continues to be remarkable about wine in Georgia are the people who pursue their passion for growing vines. It's the people who make Georgia wine interesting, their stories and their dedication to making a quality glass of this ancient beverage. And every winery that opens up adds to the story of the rebirth of Georgia wine. I would say my ultimate goal is to be able to leave my legacy to my kids, to leave this winery and give them an opportunity that I didn't necessarily have. I think that would be the ultimate goal for me, and to be able to give it to them in a, in a, in a condition to where they can take it and grow it tenfold from where I'm at now.